It's a little hot up here sometimes. Every once in a while, maybe. Well, good morning. Wonderful to, uh, to be with you on this Labor Day weekend. And uh, let me uh, extend my appreciation to our music team. I'm uh, thankful for you all leading us in worship through song this morning. It uh, was a wonderful time to, to praise the Lord in, in song and very powerful to think on the, the words of these hymns that we sang this morning. Also recognize that we've got a number of visitors with us this morning, and if you're visiting with us today, uh, let me just say I'm, I'm honored that you're here. We're honored that you're here, and we praise God um, that you've taken this time this morning to come and hear from His Word. Uh, it's a blessing, and uh, I know things are crazy right now, and the way we kind of dismiss, and we go out in the parking lot, but if uh, given the opportunity, I'd love to, to meet with you, or at least shake your hand. Well, can't shake hands anymore. What can you do? At least say hi in the parking lot afterward, right? It's okay. My friends, we're living in tumultuous times. These are very different. Uh, we're, we're all kind of processing this. We're thinking through uh, together uh, how we, how we uh, deal with life as it is right now. We're in very divided times. I think we would all recognize that, whether it is COVID-19 or politics or race relations or the role of law enforcement or this or that or this or that, and the list could go on and on and on and on. And so whether we want them to be or not, whether we think they should be or not, things are not normal. They're, they're not as we, at least as we've been accustomed to them being. I'm not going to talk about the new normal and all this. People talk about that till the cows come home. But the point is, it's not the same as it was. And because of this, or at least in part because of this, people are on edge. People are on edge. I, I, I uh, had a conversation with uh, one of you here uh, just a week or two ago, and you talked about how people are edgy. And I see this. People are, they're very edgy. You understand what that means. They're, they're, they're on edge. Uh, they're maybe almost ready to explode at a, at a moment's notice. And my friends, the church is not immune to this division and edginess. People are frustrated uh, with the way things are going or not going out in the world. And uh, sometimes that, that frustration spills over uh, into the church and perhaps even the way things are going in churches. And as a result, uh, people begin to grumble and they complain. They, they grumble about the state of the world, uh, they, including all the situations and then some that I named a moment ago. Um, and at some points, that, that grumbling doesn't stop. And they begin to grumble perhaps against one another uh, or against the leadership or things like this. Brother Mark, in his midweek update uh, that I hope you watch on Facebook, appreciate or late week update depending on the time. We'll call it weekly update. How about that? Um, in the weekly update... Uh, Brother Mark urged patience, and I would concur, brother, uh, patience, patience, because, my friends, this, this uh, spirit of grumbling is happening at, all over the place when it comes to uh, people inside and outside the church, not just at Rikers Ridge. I've heard about this um, from other pastor friends of mine, that there's kind of this spirit of discontent that's starting to take root, um, and I've, I've uh, read also in recent days uh, about pastors being frustrated because they're grappling uh, with this grumbling and division within their churches. My friends, this is dangerous. If you don't believe me, I would encourage you to skim through the books of Exodus and Numbers and see how God viewed the grumbling of the Israelites. Uh, and ask yourself, is God a fan of our grumbling? Or uh, I would encourage you to look to the New Testament and see how the Apostle Paul warns us about the problems of division, edginess, and grumbling against one another in the church. Galatians chapter 5, uh, verses 13 through 15, we see the Apostle Paul saying this, or writing this, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. So now what is the solution to grumbling and to division? As a pastor, sometimes you're tempted to take the tack that Moses did. And you rebels! You read Numbers chapter, Numbers chapter 20, and you see how Moses handled the situation, and that did not go well. Moses uh, thereby enacting 
the words of James chapter 1 uh, that says, The anger of man does not achieve or accomplish the righteousness of God. That's not what we should do. My friends, the answer is there in the text that I just read. It's love. It's love. The answer is love. That's the answer to our division, our edginess, our discontentment. Listen to the Apostle Paul again, Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. So as those who have been chosen of God, in other words, those of you who are believers, the people of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. But here's the problem. This goes against our nature. Right? It's not in our nature to love like this. We don't naturally love. And we don't naturally trust the Lord in difficult times. At least I don't. We're not naturally patient. Right? We want everything right now. We go to a fast food restaurant and it's not fast enough and we get frustrated. We want everything right now. And so what do we do then? Our number one response, my friends, needs to be to pray. To pray. To pray. We must pray, my friends. In times like these, we must humble ourselves and pray. That is the response. We must seek the Lord. We must seek the Lord who is love, and we're looking at God as love this morning. We must seek the God who is love if we are going to be able to learn to love each other and the world around us. We must seek the God who is actively ruling over his creation, as we looked at recently, when we don't understand why things are going the way they're going, and we have to learn to trust him in the process. And we must seek the God who is long-suffering, and amazingly, I, there's not even a word to describe the, 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 the depth of God's patience with us. But we must seek the God who is long-suffering and patient with us if we are to learn to be patient with one another. That's the solution. And so we must pray. And I stand before you this morning and confess that I have failed to lead us in this regard. I should have called us back to this as soon as I came back from the sabbatical, and so I plead with you for your forgiveness as a congregation. My, my brothers, my sisters, what is it going to take for us to see that we need to be a praying church? Is the world literally have to fall apart for us to see that? I love this church, and I want to lead us well, and if that is going to happen, then I must lead us to pray. We must pray. So what am I calling us to do this morning? Well, I'm calling us to pray. How am I doing that? Well, for the remainder of this calendar year, 2020, for four months, 17 weeks, I looked at it. It's 17 weeks, four months, almost four months. I'm asking you to commit to pray for our church, our community, and our world for one hour each week. One hour each week. My friends, we serve a big God. Do we really believe that, though? Do we believe the words that we read from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, when he says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. My friends, we've been considering that we serve a big God throughout this series in the book of Isaiah. And so my call is for us to pray expectantly and see what this big God will do. He is calling us to pray. My friends, he's at work in many ways in our midst right now. Now, as your pastor, I have a different vantage point than you do. And I can see, not, actually right now, I physically have a different vantage point than you. But even as the pastor, I have the privilege of being engaged and involved in some, some situations uh, that maybe others don't see, and I can see the Lord at work among us. I'm amazed to see what God is doing among us, but I also recognize the truth that the enemy is at work too. 
And we can see that in the world all around us. So what am I asking us to do? I'm asking you to commit to pray for one hour each week through the end of 2020. My hour will be from 6 to 7 a.m. on Tuesdays here at the church building. You say you're crazy. What's new? What's new? I know some of y'all are up that early, so don't look at me. I get emails sometimes or texts that early in the morning. I know some of y'all are up early. Uh, so I know some of you guys are up that early. 6 to 7 a.m. on Tuesdays here at the church building. If you're able and you want to come join me, come join me. If not and no one is here, I'll still be here to pray. Um, but the time and the place are not important. right? What is important is the follow-through. And so let me help you with that a bit because I want to expand that commitment a little bit. I'm asking us as a church to pray for one hour a week for specific aspects of our church, our community, and our world. And so on Mondays, I will post a brief, a brief prayer guide on our Facebook page that will have us praying for a specific theme each week. I want to be a help in this. I don't want to just tell you to pray for a week and not help you with this. Uh, I, was, I had in my notes here that I can ask Maggie to get it out by email as well. You're sitting here. What a blessing. Praise God. It's so wonderful to see you. Uh, I want to give you a big hug. I'll, I'll pretend like I am. But since Maggie's here, uh, when it comes out on the Facebook page, if you could take that and then email it uh, to the appropriate, and we'll talk more about it. You are more likely to pray, or really to do anything, to be honest with you, if you commit to do it with someone else. Okay? Can, can I, somebody tell me that's true. I know you understand that, whether it's dieting or working out or whatever. We all know that that's the case, right? You're, you're more likely to do something if you commit to do it with someone else. And so I'm also asking you to commit to get a prayer buddy. Say, what's a prayer buddy? Well, somebody to pray with, and they're your buddy. Maybe they're not your buddy yet, but they will be. A prayer buddy. Or, even better, assemble a few people. It doesn't have to just be two. It doesn't have to be just one other person. If you want to get a group together, you say, well, who's, who's my prayer buddy? Well, it could be anybody. It could be your spouse. Uh, could be me if you show up at 6 a.m. on Tuesdays here. Uh, could <laughs> Some people are just looking at me like, you're crazy. Again, I, what's new? Or it could be, uh, again, I said your spouse. It could be uh, another uh, person in the church. There's all sorts of ways that you could do that. It could be your, your, your daughter, your son, anyone in the church here. And so how would we do that? Well, you could get together and pray at your house. You could pray over the phone. Or you could use a Zoom call. I feel like this should be a Dr. Seuss book. Like you could come up with all these different ways. You can pray on a train, and you can pray with green eggs and ham, and you can pray. There's endless possibilities, right? That's the point of what we're saying. Or if you want, you could speak to me or Mark or Mary, and you can meet up here to pray in the building. The location doesn't matter. Have we not considered the fact that God is omnipresent? What does that mean? It means that he's everywhere. And so wherever you pray, it, it doesn't really matter. The point is, are we praying? What matters is that we pray and that we persevere in our prayers. So let me go ahead and handle some potential objections because I know there's always some potential objections here. Someone may be thinking this. Well, I already pray for the church more than an hour each week. Good! <laughs> Don't stop doing that. If you're already praying for the church and the community and the world for more than an hour a week, my goodness, don't stop. Well, Pastor Kevin told me I'm supposed to only pray for that. No, that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that you can get a buddy and help them along. So maybe you take an hour and pray with someone else if you haven't been doing that before. Or how about this? Uh, this one requires a bit of humility to say, well, it sounds nice, Pastor, but I can't pray for an hour. Now, if you were thinking that, at least in your head, I appreciate your honesty. I, I, I do. I appreciate your honesty. It's nice to say, hey, pray for an hour. And you may be thinking, well, that sounds nice. I, just, I, I can't do that. So what should you do if that's your response in your mind? My friends, start somewhere. Start somewhere. Is it not better if you pray for five or ten minutes for the church each week intentionally than zero? Is that not better than zero? it's almost kind of like when you haven't worked out for a long time, uh, you build up time. This last week, ridiculously hectic week, uh, we had a funeral for a beloved church member this past week and a number of other things going on. And so this is how many times I worked out this past week. Zero. Now, do you think tomorrow I'm going to go in the gym and do the hardest workout I've ever done in the past 
What's going to happen? I'm going to be over at KDH in the ER. <laughs> right? You don't do that. <laughs> right? You don't, no, you don't work out like that. Yeah, I, I haven't worked out in five years, but I'm going to go in there and lift 400 pounds. You don't do that. You start small and you build up, right? You, you do a little bit, you do a little bit more, you do a little bit more, you do a little bit more. So maybe you can't pray for an hour, but you get a buddy and you commit to pray f- together for five or ten minutes. And you also commit to learn and to labor so that you will be able to pray for longer. That's how we progress many times in the Christian life. And that's quite okay. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. If this is an issue for you, if you're thinking that it sounds nice but I can't pray for an hour, then come talk to me. I would love to speak to you about that, and I can help you by putting a resource in your hands in the near future that can help you with this. Because an hour can seem daunting if you say, I just don't know how to pray. God's Word can guide our prayers and can give content to them. I know some of you are familiar with at least one of the resources that I'm I'm, I'm referencing. Here's another potential objection. I don't have time for this. I don't, have time. I don't have time for one hour a week. What are you talking about, Pastor Kevin? My friends, I know we're all busy. Okay, I get it. We live in a, that's a this is what our world feels like sometimes. It's just like, okay, when's it going to stop? I can't stop it. It just keeps going. Okay, let's stop and we can stop for a minute. If this is an issue for us, then we may need to reevaluate our priorities. Right? I mean, I, I think if we think about the scope of our lives, we all have the same 168 hours to work with. We don't all have the same responsibilities and things going on. But can we not block out one of those to pray for the remaining part of the year? Is it not important? And at this point, I would just ask this. Do we not see the need? <laughs> My friends, if you don't see the need, I would encourage you to just go home and watch the news for an hour or something and see. You'll, you'll probably see the need there. Or how about this? Well, it just won't work. You know, I've tried praying before, and it just never seems to work. Well, is the issue with the efficacy of prayer, the, the fact that prayer works, or is the issue the unbelief of our own hearts? Because the Scriptures demonstrate time and 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 time again, that God honors the prayers of his people. And he does work when his people pray. Not that he's a spiritual vending machine. He does everything we want him to do or some junk like that. God is God and he's the one who calls the shots. But he does honor when his people pray. And I can personally testify to the truth of this. And I think many of you can as well. How many times have you prayed and God came through in ways that you didn't even think or imagine? And so to reiterate one more time, because communication, it's helpful if it's clear, here is what I'm asking you to commit to. Number one, commit to pray for one hour a week for the remainder of the calendar year 2020. Your hour doesn't have to be the same as mine. It could be a different hour. It could be whenever. Secondly, commit to get a prayer buddy or buddies from within the church in this prayer journey. Again, it could be your spouse. It could be a family member. It could be a friend. It could be someone that you just approach and say, hey, would you be my prayer buddy? If you want me to be one of your buddies, then you're going to have to come here at 6 to 7 a.m. I know it's early on Tuesdays. I know it's early. I've already asked uh, John Michael if uh, he could be the, the wonderful recipient of my buddiness, if that's a word. And so appreciate his willingness to do that. But I'm certainly we're willing to welcome others if you'd like to come and pray. And the reason I chose such an early time is that I recognize that people work and you can get on with your daily obligations. Uh, that's a part of life. Also, watch the Facebook page and or the email for the prayer theme each Monday. Now, before I close this section, let me just say, because in talking with my wife this morning, here's another idea. You say, you know, the week's busy. This has been proposed to me before, and I think it would work wonderfully. If someone wanted to come an hour early before the service or when we resume Sunday school fully, they want to come before that, the church is open, the music practice starts up at 8 a.m., And there's places that you could go in the church. I could happily direct you to a place in the church that would be set aside for that purpose for you to pray. Pretty simple. It's really not that that complicated in that respect. And so, again, uh, the call is to pray. I'm going to remind you of this regularly, my friends. I, I genuinely see God at work here, but the enemy is at work here as well, and we need to pray. So that is what I'm calling the church to do to pray. Now, saying that, this morning I'm going to reinstitute something 
that we were doing more formally uh, prior to the shutdown and the sabbatical and all that stuff is the, the 60 seconds of prayer or one minute of prayer. Say, what do I pray about in this silent prayer for one minute? Pray that the people of God will respond in prayer. So I'm praying about praying? Yes. That's okay. We can do that, right? Or reflect on the songs that we've sung and the text that was read and the sacrifice of Jesus and the love of God that's in that. But for 60 seconds, I'm asking you to pray silently. And then when, that, when my alarm goes off here, I will lead us in prayer and we'll proceed with the sermon. Our gracious Father, you have moved mountains in the past, the heavens and the earth are yours, you created them, you formed man from the dust, and you also created a people for yourself. Father, we ask you now to move in power among your people. We ask that beyond the scope of this particular local church. And yet we still, even in the midst of asking that, we do ask for you to move in power here, Lord. We desire to see you at work among us, Father. We know that you are. We pray that you would move mountains here. That people's lives would be transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray that believers would grow in Christ, that they might more accurately reflect him and his character. And Father, even now as we consider from your word how uh, the the truth that's there, how you, you are love, would you move us? Move us to worship, move us to greater trust in you. Move us to unity as children of one Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The other day, one of my sons was working on a paper that dealt in part with some ancient pagan conceptions of divine beings or the gods. You're probably familiar with from uh, school days, Greek or uh, Roman mythology, I'm sure you, you remember some of this. I, I, I would assume most students get something like that. You remember the Greek gods, you've got Zeus, you've got Hermes, you've got Poseidon, you've got Aphrodite, etc. Or maybe you might recall their Roman counterparts. Who are the Roman counterparts of those? Jupiter, Mercury, Neptune, and Venus. I, I guess the Romans won when it came to naming the planets, it seems like. The ancient pagan gods were supposedly quite powerful, right? They could supposedly do all sorts of things as these myths indicate. But in spite of their power, they were petty. And they often fought one another. They, they lusted after each other, and sometimes after humans, and at times they took advantage of the objects of their lust. If you're thinking of a way then to describe the ancient Greek or Roman gods, you're probably not going to think of the word love. It it just, that doesn't, that's not in their character. You read enough of those myths and you see that that's not the case. But the reality is that the ancient Greeks and Romans uh, and their gods are not alone in this. 
Some of you know that one of the things that appeals to Muslims about the the Christian God or the God of the Bible is that He is loving. Of course, we know that the Scriptures say that He is love. And Muslims cannot say that about Allah. I'm not making some kind of anti-Muslim statement and saying that. I'm just reflecting the reality that many missionaries on the field will tell you that this is an appeal uh, in the Muslim world that the God of the Bible is a God of love. And so they're able to witness uh, to the reality of the Christian faith in part by emphasizing the love of God. Now let me reiterate uh, for a moment the point of this series. The goal is for us to understand something of who God is as he reveals himself in his word. We don't want to create God in our own image, as many people have done and still do today. The Greeks did that. The Romans did that. Other world religions do that today. And many people who would even describe themselves as Christians do that when they allow the world to form their conception of who God is. Their concept of God, if it's formed by the world, then my friends, this is idolatry. We create a false God in the image of man, and that is idolatry. Why is this important? Well, my friends, I think the Lord makes it pretty clear in his word how he feels about idolatry. It's not positive. The Cliff Notes version, how does God feel about idolatry? It's really bad. It's not okay. And so just to skim the Old Testament, you'll see that Israel paid dearly for their idolatrous ways. The idolatry is not a good thing. Now, when it comes to our text today and we think about how God is love, I'll simply say this. How is the thought of an unloving God helpful? How is that that helpful? How in the world can we find hope and encouragement in helpless times if God is not love? Right? How, how, do we, how do we cope with the reality of the brokenness around us? Well, thankfully, this text and many others remind us of the glorious truth that God is love. And so as we consider our passage this morning, we're going to ask and answer three questions. And in the course of answering those questions, we're going to see quite clearly that God is love. So Gary, go ahead and we'll pull up the first one. The first question is this, who is the servant in the passage that Mark read? The answer, quite simple. The servant is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I mentioned last week, if you were here in our series in Isaiah, that there's a new section of Isaiah that begins in chapter 49. If you're working through the book of Isaiah, you come to chapter 49, there's a new section. And in chapter 49 and following, you see this this character appearing multiple times. And that character is this servant of the Lord. And so, For us as readers, the question naturally arises in our minds, who is this servant? Now, if you've been a Christian for a lengthy period of time and you're familiar with this passage, you're probably thinking, duh, the servant is Jesus. We can go home, right? You wish, right? Hey, I heard you laughing. (laughs) And yet... Judaism, which affirms the book of Isaiah as Scripture, would reject the idea that the servant is Jesus Christ. And many other Bible scholars, uh, probably more of a a, a liberal theology bent, would, would say, no, the servant is not Jesus. So who do they say that he is? Some say that the servant is Israel. Others say that the servant is Moses. Others say that it's Isaiah or that it is perhaps one of the other Old Testament prophets, maybe Jeremiah or someone else. Interestingly, we actually see someone specifically asking this question, who is the servant in the New Testament? We, we see that question being asked by the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. We can pick up in Acts chapter 8, verse 30. We see Philip. Philip ran up and heard him, that being the, that, him being the Ethiopian eunuch, heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of Scripture which he was reading was this, and it's going to sound very familiar because he's reading the text or a portion of the text that we're in today in Isaiah chapter 53. He was led as a sheep to slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation for his life is removed 
from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? In other words, who is the servant, of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. So who did Philip say that the the servant is? Unequivocally, Philip gives this answer that the servant is Jesus. Now we could stop there and say, okay, we recognize that the servant is Jesus from Acts chapter 8 and move on. But actually, as we consider the portrait of the servant in our text in Isaiah 53 and in the preceding chapters, we see several indicators that the servant is not Israel, is not Moses, is not Isaiah, but rather is Jesus Christ. For example, go back a little bit, Isaiah chapter 49. Again, I told you it started in chapter 49, this section. In chapter 49, uh, in verse 5, we see this, And now says the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God is my strength. He says, Is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel? I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And that is exactly what we see happening in the book of Acts. You read the book of Acts and you see that the message of salvation through Jesus Christ is not just going to the the people of Israel, to the Jews. It is going beyond that. And it goes from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so we see this being fulfilled in the book of Acts. Isaiah chapter 50, verses 6 and 7. We read this. I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting, for the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I am not disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. And so in that portion of Isaiah chapter 50, we're seeing that the servant is being abused by men in some very specific ways. We see the Lord Jesus enduring this type of behavior prior to his crucifixion. For example, John chapter 19, verse 1. Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him. If you know what scourging is, they they were ripping open his back. They're, they're, They're doing terrible things, whipping him, fragments of bone or metal just grabbing on, just terrible. Verse 2, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a purple robe on him. And they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, and to give him slaps in the face. Why are they doing that? They're mocking him. They're abusing him. They're mistreating him. Matthew chapter 26, similar portrait here. Then they spat in his, that's Jesus, they spat in his face, mentioned specifically there in Isaiah chapter 50. They spat in his face and beat him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, you Christ Who is the one who hits you? They're mocking him. They're hitting him. They're spitting on him. He gave his back to them. We're seeing specific fulfillment of the things in the book of Isaiah. Then in Isaiah chapter 53, in verse 7 in our text, we see that the servant is silent as he's going to his death. It says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent, before it shears, so he did not open his mouth. In other words, he's not speaking up to defend himself. He's basically just like an animal going to slaughter. Well, what's that about? Well, my friends, the gospel writers very specifically note that Jesus is silent as he's going through his mock trials. You say, well, it's just a detail. No, it's an important detail because it's verifying the identity of the servant. Matthew chapter 26 In verse 62, the high priest stood up and said to him, Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus is silent. He's silent. He's not responding. I I don't know if I, I, I could do that. He's silent. And he's doing it for a reason. Matthew chapter 27, we see similar, same gospel. 
There's two trials, if you will, if you want to call them mock trials. One is before the Jewish religious leaders, and one is, is before the Roman governor Pilate in chapter 27. That's what we're seeing. And while he, that is Jesus, was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Again, he's silent. Then Pilate, the Roman governor, said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? Speak, man. And he did not answer him with regard to even a single charge, so the governor was quite amazed. How can someone stand there who is clearly innocent and not say a word when death is on the line? He's fulfilling what's there in Isaiah chapter 53. That's how, because he is the divine servant. Then in several places in our passage there, in Isaiah chapter 53, we see this one very, 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 very important concept reiterated. The servant suffered and died for the iniquities or the sins of others. Chapter 53, verse 4. Surely our griefs he, he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, not his, ours. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And we also see this in verse 8 and verses 10 through 12. And then verse 9 informs us that Jesus himself did no wrong. In other words, he was sinless. Of course, the, the author of Hebrews uh, meditates on that. My friends, the fact that Jesus Christ suffered and died for the sins of others is, is at the core of the gospel message. That's at the core of the good news of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, Paul, the Apostle Paul articulates that in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance, not second or third, but as first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Christ died for our sins. Isaiah 53, that is what we see. The servant dying not for his own iniquities, not for his own transgressions, not for his own sins, but for the sins of others. And that is exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying, look, it's the servant. It's the servant. He, Christ, died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Which Scriptures? Isaiah 53 is one of them. Yes, the servant. And we could go on and on. Verse 9 in our text mentions this seemingly obscure fact that he was with a rich man in his death. You say, what in the world is that about? The detail is there for a reason, my friends. It's fulfilled shortly after the death of Jesus. Matthew chapter 27 in verse 57, we pick up and it says, When it was evening, this is after the death of Jesus, there came a rich man. Rich man? Well, what's he doing there? A rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. So why is that detail in there? It's being fulfilled in Christ. He died as a criminal. He died as a criminal. He's crucified as a criminal. What do you do with the body of the criminal? You don't stick him in the tomb of a rich man, I can tell you that, unless God said that that's what was going to happen, and then it actually happens in the death of Christ. And there's a number of other aspects that we could look at this morning of these so-called servant songs in this part of Isaiah that point to Jesus Christ. For instance, the servant's humble background. He, 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 there's hints of the resurrection there as well. And so it's no wonder that a Bible commentator named Jeffrey Grogan says this at the end of his comments on Isaiah 53. He says this, our present passage, Isaiah 53, speaks so eloquently of the work of Christ that even the inclusion of his name 
could add but little more to the extent of its disclosure of him. In other words, it is so clear, so undeniably crystal clear that the servant in Isaiah 53 and the chapter surrounding that it is the Lord Jesus Christ, that even if his name was there, it really wouldn't add very much to it. It is so blatantly obvious that the servant is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so to his comment, I say, amen. So the servant is Jesus. But I thought that the passage or what we we're talking about today is the fact that God is love. Well, that gets us to a second question. Second question, how does this passage show us that God is love? The answer is simple. The servant's death for the sins of others demonstrates that God is love. The servant's death for the sins of others demonstrates that God is love. Some of you are probably already connecting the dots in your head. You've got the little connect the dots, la, 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 la. If somebody else is around 40, you probably know where I get that from. You're connecting the dots in your head and you're saying, yes, yes, yes. But I could see someone objecting and saying, well, I don't see the word love in this passage, Kevin. You're importing something into the text that's not there. I don't see love in this passage. My friends, the word love may not be used there. But the picture is clearly love. It is clearly, as the New Testament authors recognize, they recognize that Isaiah 53, even though it does not explicitly mention love, it certainly depicts it. It definitely depicts it. The text paints the picture of the sinless servant dying for the sins of others. And as the New Testament authors recognize, the death of Jesus is the ultimate demonstration of love. It is the ultimate demonstration of love. You know some of these verses, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. How do we know that God loved the world or in what manner did he do it? He gave his only begotten son. That's, that's how we know love. John chapter 15, verse 13, the Lord Jesus says this, Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Love. What is the servant doing in Isaiah 53? He's laying down his life willingly. Romans chapter 5, we read this earlier. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. So part of the whole point leading up to this in Romans is that we're not good. We're not good. Maybe for a good man someone would die, but actually God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Isaiah 53, how does God demonstrate his love? While we were sinners, transgressors, people filled with iniquity, Christ died for us. That is a demonstration of the love of God. 1 John 3.16. It's easy to remember that way, right? you got John 3.16, you got 1 John 3.16. Even I can remember that. 1 John 3.16, we know love by this, that he, that is Jesus, laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. How, how do we know love? He laid down his life for us. Isaiah 53, in a nutshell. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us And what did he do? Because he loved us, he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propiti what? Well, a few weeks ago we looked at that. That's the turning away of wrath by an offering. In other words, someone took the place of others as an offering, a sinless, spotless sacrifice. That's Jesus, Isaiah 53. God is love. We see that later in 1 John 4, and the death of the servant demonstrates that. Demonstrates that. Now, we got one more question that we need to ask before we close today. And this question actually has multiple answers to it. And the question is this, why does this matter? Or another way of putting it would be, how does this apply? What am I supposed to do with this? Answer 3A in my notes. Answer 3A. The truth that God is love is the heart of the gospel. The truth that God is love is the heart of the gospel. If God's not love, there's no good news. Right. If God is not love, there is no good news. There is no gospel. There's only the expectation of wrath. If God is not love, but my friends, he is love. And thankfully, there is a gospel message as Isaiah 53 shows us, demonstrates. 
Verse 6 alone in our text provides us with the essentials of the gospel. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. In other words, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We all try to put the crown on our own head, and it ends up being, like I said several weeks ago, it's like that Burger King crown. Yeah, remember? The Burger King crown. That's not real. It's, it's real cardboard. But it'd make you king of anything. Maybe you're a whopper until you eat it. But you're not really the king. We want to be the king. We want to do things our way. We want to go astray. And in so doing, we are rebelling. We're shaking our fist at the Creator and saying, I'm going to be in charge here. Read Psalm 2 sometime. Second Psalm. The Lord looks in heaven. He scoffs. He laughs. The kings of the earth, they take their stand against the Lord and His anointed one. And God's laughing. It's laughable. It's, it's, it's humorous almost, not in a funny ha-ha way. We all have rebelled, and because of that, we rightly deserve the wrath of God. That's what we deserve. And yet, the Lord placed our iniquity on the servant, on Christ. My friends, that's the good news. Do you not see how that is the good news? He bore our sins. He stood in our place so that we could be forgiven, that we could be reconciled to God. That's the best news I can give you. There is no greater news. I could stand up here and tell you that I, I've got a billion dollars for you today, and it wouldn't be as good. I don't. And it wouldn't be as good a news as that. Christ died in our place so that Paul could say in Romans 8, 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And this same servant was raised from the dead and he lives forever. He's alive today and he's able to make sinners right with God. And so my question today for you is this. Have you turned to the servant in faith? Have you turned to the servant in faith? Have you looked to the one who is able to save? Have you turned to this servant? Or are you still seeking to bear your own sins? Don't do that. It won't work, I promise you. Turn from your sin, repent, and believe. Place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and find hope in him. My friends, if you're wrestling with that, I would love nothing more. There would be no greater joy in my life than to sit and talk and pray with you and point you to the hope that is found in Jesus Christ alone. No greater joy. I can't imagine anything. I'd rather have that than a billion dollars. But, of course, the gospel is not just for unbelievers. We need to preach the gospel to ourselves, too, as the late Jerry Bridges often noted. On our best day, we need the gospel to humble us. Because when we're tempted to be prideful and say, boy, I didn't I do well today, we need the gospel to say, you still fell short. You still need a Savior. And on our worst days, we still as believers need the gospel because we need to be reminded that God loves us in spite of who we naturally are. Dude, I'm a wreck. A wreck. A total wretch. But God still loves me. And how do I know that? I know that because he gave his son for me. Is that not good news? Don't we need to remind ourselves of that? There's another reason why this matters. Answer 3B. Clinging to the attributes of God teaches us to trust him. Now, I've been very open since the sabbatical about the fact that I'm regularly working with a biblical counselor. You say, why would you do that? Are you some kind of weirdo? Sure. Actually, my hope is that I can be an example to the church in this. If you are struggling with something, it is more honorable to get help. It's more honorable to get help. It's more shameful to just be prideful and not do anything. When we're struggling with something and we need help, it's better to get help. And quite frankly, I often struggle to trust God. You ever struggle to trust God? You ever feel that load and struggle to trust God? Especially when I feel overloaded and I'm emotionally drained. And so Pastor Tim, my counselor, gives me homework to work on. Here's a quote from my most recent assignment from this past week. Quote, follow this plan when you are tempted to anxiety or worry. And then he gives me several things to do. And one of them is this. Make God your refuge. Recall the attributes of God. Take three attributes you have presented in your Isaiah study and write down how they give you hope and anxiety. Use this to discipline your mind. My friends, that's good. It's helpful. It's helpful. 
We, we take these attributes of God and we meditate on them, we think on them, we pray on them, and we discipline our minds. And when I'm tempted to be anxious, I can easily meditate on the fact that God is love. You know what? My life seems out of control, but I know and I cling to the truth from your word, Lord, that you are love and that you love me and that you demonstrate it. And God's peace begins to reign in our lives. You can do the same thing too. When we cling to the attributes of God and we see how great and how good he is, we learn to trust him more. Now there's a third answer to our question of why this matters. Understanding who God is helps us see that he is worthy of worship. We talked about that song this morning. It's great. Worthy of worship, right? He is worthy of worship. I've talked about this before. I won't dwell on it. But if there's ever an attribute, uh, attribute of God that could, should cause us to, to reflect on his greatness and why we should worship him, it's the fact that he loves us even though we are totally unlovable. You ever seen like those ugly dog competitions? Like this just ridiculously ugly dog. You look at it, oh, how could somebody love that dog? It's like missing, it just looks terrible. And you're thinking, man, I'd rather have the puppy over here. What do I want this ugly dog for? Think about that and multiply it by like 10,000. And you see how reprehensible our sin is to the Lord. And yet he still loves us. My friends, he is worthy of worship. He's worthy of, I'm not pointing at you. What about me? Same thing. I'm worse than that ugly dog, chief of ugly dogs. Paul, Paul says he's a chief of sinners, chief of ugly dogs. God still loves us. He's worthy of our worship. Last thing, answer 3D. Texts like Isaiah 53 strengthen our faith. This text can have apologetic value. For unbelievers, we look at this and we say, here is a man who wrote nearly 700 years before the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, and he nailed it to a T. To a T. How did he do that? God inspired this. God's in control over the future. Go there. But even as believers, this can strengthen our faith. My friends, if I told you that I'm going to describe somebody with a high degree of accuracy who will be around in the year 2720, what would you say about that? Man, Kevin, you're an even bigger idiot than I thought you were. That's what you would say. And I hope you would say that. And yet here is Isaiah the prophet Looking hundreds of years into the future, why? Because he's magical or something? No, because he's giving a message from God who is over the future, who rules over all things. And we look at that, and it strengthens our faith. And we say, if God can do that, then why don't I trust him? Lord, help me to trust you daily. God is good, and he's great. That's the point of this whole series. That's the whole point of this whole series. If we come away from this series in Isaiah and we recognize and apply to our own lives the fact that God is both great and that he is good, then, then it's accomplished something. He's worthy of worship. He's worthy of our trust. And so we look to this and our faith is strengthened. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the power that's in your word. Thank you for the loving sacrifice of our Lord Jesus who willingly gave himself for us. We pray now for one who may be among us wrestling with these truths Perhaps you're working in this, this man or woman or, or child in, the, in their heart. Coming to grips with the truth that Jesus is the servant, he's the Messiah, he's your son, he is the Savior, the Lord of all. By your kindness, Lord, would you draw this one to repentance and faith in Jesus God, there, there's others, I'm sure, in a time like this, it's not a stretch. It's not mysticism to recognize that there's some folks who are here today who are hurting and struggling and wondering what next week is going to look like. God, we thank you for the truth that you are love, that you love that one, and that you're in control over next week.
and next month and next year. Father, encourage us, please, we pray. Through what we see in these passages in Isaiah. Fill us with a heart of worship, not just on Sunday mornings, not just in a corporate worship service, but a lifestyle of worship. Do your work among us. For your own glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.